みなさん、Good evening and happy early Thanksgiving to you all. My name is Yasuko Uchida. I am director of the Japan Foundation Los Angeles. Thank you very much for attending our event. I'm very, very happy that there is a large audience today. Well, today we are very pleased to present to you a lecture about horses and horse medicine in medieval Japan. Please let me introduce today's guest. Mr. David Lamy, Lamy. David Lamy san. Oh. Oh, well, he, he's not a, a peer. Lamy Here I am. Lamy san. Uh, the, uh, this is Dr. Dr. David Lamy. Uh, he has been practicing equine veterinarian for many years. And at the same time, he has a lot of affection toward horses and Japanese history. He will soon also be publishing an intriguing book about horses and horses, horse, horses medicine in medieval Japan. Our another guest is Miss Kaoru Tomoyoshi. Kaoru-san, hello. Hi. She is one of his co-authors and support, supported this project a lot from Japan. The two of them will talk about this coming book, The Little Known History of Horses in Japan, their relationship with Japanese people, as well as horse medicine. You will be amazed and enchanted to know how horses in medieval Japan were treated and healed in many ways beyond your imagination. This talk session will be about 45 minutes and 15 minutes Q&A session will be at the end. During the talk session, Please write any questions you have in the Q&A box at any time. They will try to answer your question after the session as long as time permits. So, well, it's time to start. So please enjoy yourself. Thank you very much for attending um, our lecture on horses and horse medicine in Muromachi, Japan. This is uh, 16th century Japan, late 16th century. Um, and uh, let's get started. So I'm David Ramey. I am a veterinarian. I'm a practicing veterinarian in the Los Angeles, California area. Um, I'm a 1963 graduate of Colorado State University. Uh, as I said, I work in Los Angeles with horses of all types, but I don't uh, restrict my activity to just working on horses. I'm also a published author and uh, spoken at locations all over the world and lectured. And as a sidelight, and it sort of got me into this, I'm also published in uh, historical journals on the history of Chinese veterinary medicine. So now I'd like to introduce Kaoru. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kaoru Tomoyoshi. I am one of the co-authors of this book. I graduated from Kobe City University in 2006 with a bachelor's degree of arts in international relations. And I also a nationally licensed tour guide in Japan, Kobe. And I usually show my clients around my local Kobe and other cities nearby, like Osaka and Kyoto and Himeji. And you can find me and book my tours from the website which is shown on the screen right now. Thank you. So this manuscript has an interesting story. I've had uh, an interest in, in uh, medicine in, in Asia for some time. And as I um, took a trip to Kyoto last year, I had the wonderful chance to meet a new friend, uh, Takayuki Hara, who runs a um, uh, who runs an antiquarian bookshop in Kyoto. And when I was there, um, he gave me 
possibly the greatest gift that I've ever been given. He gave me this manuscript on horses and horse medicine in Japan. And he had only a vague idea of what it is. And I had no idea of what it was. But being curious, I decided that I had to find out. Now, I can't read uh, old Japanese and neither can... Uh, uh, you know, people that are living in Japan now. So I had to enlist some other co-authors. Uh, one is Dan Shearer. He's a PhD and a lecturer in Asian studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, focusing on the history of pre-modern Japan. So this is right in his wheelhouse as far as the time goes. He studied and researched in uh, Tokyo and Kyoto. And as I said, currently he maintains a position at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, he's also doing the translation of this manuscript from the old Japanese script into modern English. We're also assisted by uh, Dr. Katya Triplett. Now Katya is uh, in Germany. She's an affiliate professor at Phipps University in Marburg. And she specializes uh, in the study of Japanese religion and medicine um, and has published widely on this, including a new book on uh, uh, Buddhism and medicine in Japan. So uh, between Katya, Dan, and Kaoru, we've got quite an international collaboration going on, but it's not just us four. Yes, uh, we have so many contributors. And, you know, when we started this project back in April, it was out of blue that David wanted me to be his co-author. And I also didn't expect him to make me work this hard, but anyways. <laughs> Uh, our project has been supported by so many kind of people from all over Japan, and we've listed their names on this slide. I would especially thank the Horse Museum in Yokohama. This is the only museum in Japan exclusively dedicated to the horse. It keeps much historical information and art about horse and equine culture in Japan. We asked uh, for their help to understand the medieval equine industry and they kindly opened their doors to us and gave us permission to use some very rare images. And other contributors were just as helpful too. They gave us advice about the people we should talk to, uh, which book we should read and which images we might like to use. Because when we started, we didn't know what to expect from those associations and museums. But all of them understood what we were trying to do and gave us directions to make this project better. So uh, we can't thank them enough for their time and their assistance. And this project could not have happened without them. So why Japanese horses? This is, a, this is actually a, a print that I have from early 19th century of a horse market south of Nagoya in, in Shiryu. Well, for some reason, a couple of years ago, I decided that I needed to learn Japanese. And so I've been working very hard trying to uh, pick up uh, the Japanese language. Um, I've long had a love of history and horses and in, including Chinese medicine. And as it turns out, this manuscript really piqued my interest because there's so little that is, there's relatively little that's known uh, about the history of horse medicine and not a lot published even about the history of horses in Japan. So I just decided I needed a project and this became it. So the introduction of horses to Japan is so interesting in my mind because we can trace it. We can trace it from the beginning to where it is now. But it's a fact that the introduction of horses into the Japanese islands changed Japan. It, it ushered in a new app a new era in Japanese culture and history. It changed the way wars were fought. It allowed for empires to expand because with horses came roads because roads could then allow traveling into the Japanese inland, which is very mountainous and was previously inaccessible. With roads came the ability to extend the influence of the rulers over the into the beautiful Japanese landscape. Now, 
horses are not native to the Japanese island. Uh, there's no fossil evidence for the prehistoric existence of horses. In fact, we can date fairly precisely when horses came to Japan. In the third century, there is a uh, book known uh, in Japan as the Gishi Waijindin that was published in the third century, and there the author noted that there were no horses in Japan. But most authorities believe that shortly thereafter, uh, in the Kofun period, um, the uh, horses began to make their arrival onto the Japanese island. Now, the Kofun period was a, a time that culture started being shared between the Korean Peninsula and the uh, main Japanese islands. And it's in fact thought that all horses that are native Japan native to Japan come from animals that were brought from the, Asian, from the Asian mainland at various times. And then later horses were taken from Honshu, the, the largest island in Japan to the northernmost island of Hokkaido to assist in agriculture. The first people to um, get their hands on horses as it were, were the uh, Japanese nobility. And the Japanese initially thought that horses were just absolutely incredible creatures. They thought they were divine. Um, and uh, they were first at least made notice of by Prince Shotoku, who's one of the most important and celebrated figures in Japanese history. Um, this is an image from the Tokyo National Museum. Um, the prince um, helped bring Chinese culture to Japan including Buddhism, which fairly quickly took over Japan, and he created a constitution and built roads and temples. Um, and he's also said to have found the first school of animal medicine in Japan. There aren't any records of that, but he was responsible. Now in this image, it's interesting um, that within a hundred years after his death, uh, the prince was pictured riding his black horse, Kuruma, over Mount Fuji, you can see him there on the screen, uh, going flying over Mount Fuji all the way over the top of the, the most famous mountain in Japan. This is also from the uh, National Museum in Tokyo showing a stable uh, back in medieval Japan. And initially it was the nobility that had the time and money to take care of horses to learn about them. Now horses for the nobility were, uh, they were certainly um, used for commerce, but importantly, they were used as engines of war. Um, they uh, trained mounted archers to try to help keep the peace. They built post stations, not unlike the American Pony Express, where they would keep horses and messages could be taken from various uh, locations to another. Um, they were dedicated to the deities. Initially, horses were sacrificed, and then after they figured out that that was a waste of horses. They found other things to do with them, but they were given as gifts. Um, they were paid as wages. They were used as currency and taxes. So they became just wildly important. But no more important thing was their use, at least initially, than in war. Once horses were introduced to Japan, their advantages of vehicles of war became rather obvious. This is a saddle and stirrups from a samurai warrior's horse. Um, those of you that ride will be interested in looking at the stirrup. It's a very distinct shape. Uh, it's got a, a covering on the toe and it allows for the rider to stand easily in the stirrup, but also not get caught in them. Um, but they did ride in iron stirrups, they used iron bits, and they decorated their horses rather extravagantly. Um, horses were a sense of pride, and, and so this was expensive. And because they were so expensive, and because training the horses took so much time, the wealthy class, as we said, were the first people that got to uh, use them. Now, this is uh, from a scroll that's at the Museum of the Horse in Yokohama, and as Kaoru noted, they generously um, have allowed us to use images from a scroll that they have there. But this is training uh, for horseback uh, warfare. But it's interesting that the cavalry or the, the, the horse-mounted warriors was kind of unlike cavalry pretty much anywhere else in the world, because most of the time, um, the Japanese warriors rode their horses to battle and then got off. Um, the horses were so valuable that they didn't have these massed cavalry charges. Rather, they were used as a, a means of travel and transport. 
Um, and when they had to travel long distances, they would usually have another horse, and then that horse would be attended by an attendant or a servant. So after the Warring States period now, so we're talking roughly 1600, um, um, the, the use of horses became more widespread because in the warring, once the Warring States period was over and the Edo era period began, warfare was prohibited. They said pretty much knock it off. And so horses, which were used mostly in war previously, soon became found at all levels of Japanese society. And the shomin, the, the common people, um, began to use them. Now, interestingly, one of the strict rules for horse owners was that nobody could ride them unless they were members of the warrior class. Um, medieval Japan had four classes, um, and unless you were in the upper class, you couldn't ride your horse, and that means that for people of lower socioeconomic status, uh, the merchants, the artisans, and all, they walked alongside their horses. So that led the development in the Kyoto area of an organization called Bashaku, which was basically um, the teamsters of medieval Japan. They set up a uh, transportation and cargo carrying group to move shipments and they became very wealthy and very influential. Um, they took advantage of their location on major waterways to start their own businesses and Again, they didn't ride their horses, and as this illustration from the Tokyo Museum shows, they would load them, in this case, with bags of rice and then drive them to their destination. Horses also became uh, important in agricultural use, and in northern Japan, horses were used for the production of manure. Now, um, the growing season in northern Japan in the Tohoku region, for example, is fairly short. The winters are long and cold, and so cold. So fertilizer um, was uh, very valuable and horses uh, produced, oh, something along the lines of 20 to 50 pounds of manure every single day. And so by storing and drying this the manure, they could then spread it on the fields and optimize food production. And during the Edo period, so 17th century, uh, farmers in northern Japan had an average of about two and a half horses per farmer. Now, um, horses were, it, Japan is, is not a great place for agriculture. Only about 20% of the, the main island of Honshu is arable. Uh, crops can be, uh, crops are difficult to grow in the mountains. And these conditions made it hard for horses too. But horses were used in the rice paddies to pull large holes. Um, the large hose, but these, uh, but their legs, which are of course slender, were easily trapped in the mud. Nevertheless, they moved faster than oxen did, and they also um, churned up the earth better. So they were really the preferred animal for use in agriculture in northern Japan, and they also would found uh, found work as pack animals. Now they were so valuable that um, homes were built that included stables in them, and they were notable for their large roofs, which covered both the house and the stable. Usually the stables were next to the entryways of the house, and that served to um, protect, the or, uh, protect the horses from being stolen. Here in this uh, image, what we obtained courtesy of the Kawasaki Open Air Museum in Kawasaki, you can, the arrow is pointing to where the stables were, and um, this allowed for the farmers to keep an eye on their horses, not only to keep them from being stolen, but to keep an eye on their health. Now, eventually, horses became so widespread that horses even entered the vernacular of the Japanese language. And so there are some interesting expressions that still persist today um, pertaining to the horse. Yes, um, as David explained, horses used to be a big part of people's life in Japan. And that makes some Japanese phrases or Japanese saying related to horses. Here, I would like to introduce three Japanese uh, phrases which related to horses. The first one is uma no mimi ni nembutsu, which literally means players to a horse's ear. You know, if a person is given good advice but ignores it, 
Japanese people may say that offering advice to that person is no more effective than if a person were to whisper players into the ears of horses. And here's the second one, which is uma no hana muke, which literally means in the direction of the horse's nose. Well, this Japanese idiom originally means to throw a farewell party or give gift to a person who is departing on a long journey. In the Nara era, horses were ridden for travel, and people who came to see the travelers off would point the horse's nose in the direction of the traveler was going to head to, in order to wish them safety on the road. Today, uma no hanamuke is still in use, but shortened as hanamuke, and which means a farewell message or a farewell party. And here's the third one, which is sai o ga uma, means sai o's horse. Well, the original story is Chinese, and it refers to an uh, unpredictability of life. And without understanding the story behind this saying, this phrase makes no sense. So here's the story. During the period of war in ancient China, Sai O's horse ran away into enemy's territory. Was this bad luck? No, he returned with other horses. Was this good luck? No, Sai O's son decided to try to ride all of the new horses and he fell off, and he broke his leg. So was this the bad luck? No, many young people died in the war, but Sayo's son could not go because of his broken leg. See, the model of Sayo's horse is when something happened, you can never say for sure how it will turn out in the end. So life is unpredictable, so it's best not to worry about every little thing. It's, it's interesting that we can also note that in 1736, uh, at the time of the eighth shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate, Western medicine and horsemanship entered Japan. And in this scene, which is from the Tokyo National Museum, uh, which was drawn in Nagasaki, um, a uh, government official is learning Western horsemanship from a German master named Kajuser, who is in the red coat here. Um, and that was all well and good, but in my opinion, it's at that time that things became somewhat less interesting because um, much of the medicine that we're now going to start talking about then gradually went away um, as they adopted uh, as they adopted new um, new techniques. So. For the second, second part of this talk, we're going to talk about the medicine that is in this manuscript. Now, this drawing is from the first known manuscript uh, related to horse medicine in Japan from 1267. This is also in the collection of the Tokyo National Museum. Um, there's no record of the earliest horse medicine that was practiced in Japan. You know, medicine in Japan initially was in the hands of, of the gods, the kami, who are, were divine spirits. And, and the sort that were common in most known cultures, most cultures have given some credence to external uh, spiritual forces causing disease, and the Japanese were no different. Now, the Japanese gods could, could heal illness and, and could cause disease, and the demons were, uh, diseases were also caused by um, demons and evil spirits. And here in this uh, picture from the uh, manuscript, you can see one of those demons hovering uh, over a horse. Um, and uh, we're not sure what this says just yet, but the book will be translating all of, all of these things. Although I can tell you that on the right-hand side of that page, those are talismans or things that you would say in order to try to help protect the horse or chase the demons away. Yeah, demons. Demons are everywhere in Japan, in history, art, and even in this year's hottest blockbuster movie in Japan called Demon Slayer, 
which leaked to 10 billion Japanese yen within 10 days of its opening. Uh, from ancient days, Japanese have believed demons exist. Demons are evil spirits, which cause bad things to humans and animals too. In the past, when bad things happened, for example, an epidemic, people blamed them on evil spirits. I think the concept of demon is deeply related to our religions. For example, Shinto is a fundamental religion in Japan. It is a mixture of mythology and nature worship. In Shinto, we believe there are hundreds of deities and spirits in nature. We worship them and are afraid of them too. In the old days before science, when this book was written, people used those spirits as explanations for the events beyond their understanding. When horses had weird symptoms, doctors claimed that they were possessed by demons. Apparently, there were some demons that especially haunted horses. And perhaps the best known demon is called Taiba or Giba. Taiba changes its appearance from region to region, but is mostly known as a wind. But uh, as you can see in, in this screen, the picture, Taiba shows its appearance in a kimono clad woman on a horseback. And Taiba attacks horses by getting into their bodies through the nostrils and out from anus. Taiba might be scared by blood colors or by flesh blood. So horse hunters kept thin needles in their hair to, um, so that uh, they could rescue the horse by cutting it behind the ear. The concept of demon is still present in Japanese modern society. Not that we are still threatened by them, but demons still act as invisible risks. For example, February 2nd is the day of Setsubun, on which we throw roasted soybeans from home to chase evil demons away. When throwing the beans, you are supposed to shout Oni wa soto, fuku wa uchi, or demons out, happiness is in. And afterwards, you pick up and eat the number of soybeans that corresponds to your age in hopes of bringing health and prosperity in the year ahead. One of the interesting things about this manuscript is that there are basically five different types of medicine represented. The first and prominently is an esoteric tradition of Buddhist medicine. Esoteric meaning that it is a secret tradition of Buddhist medicine as opposed to an exoteric or a, a, a medicine that was meant for more public um, consumption. Met, uh, Buddhist medical practices entered Japan along with Buddhism in a the sixth century, we, we know pretty precisely. Um, and it was introduced to Japan from Korea, which at the time was called Goguryeo. Um, the Buddhist texts though were actually translations from Sanskrit into classical Jap uh, Chinese. So more than anything else, the medicine in this book resembles Buddhist Indian traditions of medicine than it does Chinese medicine. Um, in fact, the, but this Buddhism and the Chinese style medicine and Taoist practices form kind of a hybrid religious and healing culture in early Japan that is represented in this book. And in particular, um, this book uh, is, uh, dedicated to the Bato Kanon or the horse-headed Kanon, one of the uh, uh, four principal spirits of Buddhism. And the manuscript again shows the strong influence of Buddhist medicine in Japanese horse care during this period. The uh, Bato Kanon um, is the Japanese Buddhist god of mercy or the Lord who perceives the cries of the suffering beings. And due to the name Bato, which means horse head, um, the, gar, the, uh, the god is worshiped as a guardian Buddha of horses in folk 
beliefs. And traditionally, he was associated with, or he or she, I suppose, was associated with warriors and samurai. And those who worshipped Bato Kanon were said to be protected from all sorts of calamities and sickness and accidental death. But it wasn't just horses. And the manuscript has a couple of pictures of oxen. Um, and so the Kanon saved not only horses, but all beasts as well. Um, as we mentioned on the opening slide on medicine, the first book on Japanese horse medicine, uh, the Bai Soshimaki, or the Scroll of uh, Equine Medicine um, from 1267 is held at the Tokyo National Museum. And, and Kaoru, it has another name as well, doesn't it? It's, yes, it's also called Uma Ino Soshi Emaki. So um, the Emaki is a scroll, an illustrated scroll. And it's really, it's a fascinating, fascinating scroll. It, um, it shows, uh, it was handed down as a, a secret text for horse doctors during the Kamakura period, which is before the Muromachi period. And the, the fact that this is secret is what makes, is one of the things that makes this manuscript interesting. As I said, this is the esoteric tradition. This was a tradition that was not meant to be shared among the general public. These were special people that were devoted to the healing of horses. Now, the, the book from 1267 lists the name of 10 renowned doctors from ancient Japan and China, as well, and it shows horses that were kept in the stable. And then it also contains illustrations of 17 medicinal plants that were used at the time. A postscript at the end of the scroll describes how it was handed down to uh, presumably a military horse doctor in the new year of 1267. And it again, it, the postscript also explains how important it was that the contents of this scroll be kept a closely guarded secret. Um, secret's out now. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, but by... There, so there's not a lot of text, but by 1859... Um, a book called the, uh, uh, that's known as the Equine Medicine Book of the Anzai School, um, which was written. And this book in 1859 is in the collection of Azabu University, which has a veterinary school in Sagamihara, Japan. And it's interesting when you compare the manuscripts, this uh, from our manuscript with the demon uh, um, in some stage of possessing a horse. And the Anzai text, you can see the, that this, this is the same tradition. And in fact, the medicine in our manuscript appears to be closely related to that of the Anzai manuscript, showing that the ideas that are, that are in our manuscript are typical of what was being practiced in Japan at the time. So what is this Buddhist medicine other than, than uh, uh, demons. Well, it uh, shows 12 spirits that are associated with the Sino-Japanese zodiac, and these animal, uh, these demons appear as animals or creatures, and they also appear at certain times. So the manuscript will talk about certain times to do certain things to try to make the horses better. Um, the Chinese medicine that was um, being written about at this time has nothing at all uh, Buddhist in it. Buddhism was essentially expunged from Japan in the late 8th century. So this medicine passed through China but was not practiced in China. And Chinese medicine, which does appear, was kind of a therapeutic option, as it were. It was something for the uh, Japanese to also do. As I said, this book shows the influence of five different times of medicine. The Buddhist rituals were mostly to invite divine assistance for the, for the gods to intervene and get the horse's medicine better, whereas Chinese medicine and other things were applied in a more pragmatic and more medical context. So the Buddhist medicine contains several talismans. Now talismans are each, of, if you look at these pages at the top, you'll see a red circle and each of those red circles uh, underneath that going straight down is a talisman, which is a saying that would help theoretically bring the animal closer to the cosmos to, to uh, bring healing. Um, these talismans took the form of paper strips that could be placed on 
uh, part of the horse's body that was thought to be affected. They could be dissolved in water. They could be burned and given as medicine. They could be hung on the horse's neck or perhaps just hung in front of the horse's stall. Now, again, these things would have been secret ritual knowledge that would have been just the, the purview of the people that, had, that were uh, privy to the information in this book. Um, the book also contains uh, several sutras and mantras. Now, sutras and mantras are chanted to bring spiritual enlightenment, um, and they have other purposes, such as protecting from evil spirits. And again, these mantras connect the Buddhist cosmos to the healing power of the Buddhist deities, which they were trying to invoke for the benefit of the horse. They also use dharani or incantations to empower the medicines that they were given. So this is very much of a mixed bag of medicine being given to the Japanese horses. Now, the Heart Sutra is written in its entirety in kana, not kanji in this manuscript, which is interesting because we know from that that this manuscript was not written by a Buddhist priest. Buddhist priests would have written only in Chinese kanji, but the, this book is written in kana. Um, so the Japanese horse healers would chant the Heart Sutra to horses under their care. The Heart Sutra is probably the most well-known sutra in East Asia and beyond. You can go to YouTube and enter Heart Sutra and you'll hear various performances of the Heart Sutra. Um, uh, again, uh, the most famous undoubtedly, and the main teaching is the emptiness of all things. It also mentions the famous mantra of light, the Komyo Shingon, but it does not provide, a, uh, it does not write the mantra itself. In addition to uh, the Buddhist medicine, there's also a tradition of herbal medicine or plant-based medicine in the book. Now, this is an illustration, um, again, from the 1267 book. And um, for the Japanese, medicinal plants were, um, they became a bit of an industry. They were imported, they were cultivated, and they were also gathered from the wild. But gathering plants was difficult due to the terrain in Japan and the, and the long winters, and foreign trade at the time was, was difficult and unreliable. So there were administrative codes established in Japan. We don't have them anymore, but they were established for how the plants should be grown, and they established medicinal gardens for the, the growth of these special herbs as well as for training people how to grow them. And in addition to this, as the, um, or the Japanese themselves tried to identify their own medicinal plants that were native to Japan. Um, the herbal medicine that was given was purely on a pragmatic basis. So they saw that something was wrong with a horse and they gave it a plant. Um, so see this, give this. Um, there were Chinese medical texts imported into Japan, but ultimately the Japanese doctors didn't rely on the theory of Chinese medicine and, and relied more on com common sense and observation. Now, this is a, uh, a again, a picture from the book, from the 1267 uh, book. And it's interesting that some of the botanical preparations that are in this manuscript for 12, from 1267, are still prescribed today. Now, this, uh, this brown blob here is a fungus and it was uh, known as Indian bread or tukaho in at least uh, in English. Um, and it was shown in the 1267 book and it's also specifically named in our manuscript. And Kaoru, um, you have experience or you, you're aware of this and being used in Japan today, right? Yes, uh, I think we have some Japanese audience today, and I'm pretty sure they will agree with me that this fungus looks like uh, saru no koshikake. It's Japanese name, saru no koshikake, and which is still in use, widely used in Japan as Chinese herbal medicine, and which you know uh, makes your blood pressure kind of lower and stable, and prevents making prevents having blood clots. The book, um, one of the questions that's been asked to me about this book by uh, people that know that I've been working on this is what about acupuncture? Um, 
a, and it's it's really interesting in this book in that there is nothing um, that could be remotely described as acupuncture, at least in the modern sense of the word. Um, the, the Japanese horse doctors at this time definitely used what are described as needles or hari to treat horses. Um, this is an illustration of a hari from um, the early 17th century. And you can see the needle right there. And you can immediately recognize that the shape of this needle is not a fine filiform needle. In fact, it's much more like a spear. Now to the to right of this is the description of the size of this. Um, and to the left is a description of what they did. And what they did was they take they took this spear to a certain depth at points called keiketsu, and they let a certain amount of blood out of the horse. And in fact, this was the major tradition of Japanese and Chinese medicine for a long time was bloodletting at those points. We know that this um, needle from the description in the book was about the size of a good sized pocket knife. So this is not a thin, short, fine needle by any way, shape or form. But they also did use moxibustion or the burning of plants on uh, certain spots. They would either burn directly onto the skin or they would burn on a needle of uh, such as plants such as artemisia as described on these metal needles to try to treat disease. But again, so here's, here's a picture from the book uh, of a horse and you can see various points illustrated in red along with descriptions about where blood, or from where blood was led on these horses. Mostly um, these, you know, again, these aren't fine needles. They, they were mostly inserted at just a few points. We find 10 to 15 points that were regularly used around the face, the tail, and on the hindquarters, no matter what the conditions were. So they weren't trying to recognize that the horse had a particular thing and, and uh, treating it at a particular point. They were just treating them at um, the same points, no matter what the condition was. So we've had Buddhist medicine, we've had herbal medicines, we've had uh, Chinese medicine, but they also used other medicines. And this is where things get rather curious as well. Um, crane feathers appeared to be rather popular as a uh, medicine. They could be burned or they could be ground up and give it as medicine as could chicken feathers. What was definitely important, and I would firmly support this, is that they should only be administered with good sake. Um, it, the manuscript specifically mentions that the sake needs to be good, and I, I couldn't agree more, at least you know, from my personal experience. It's interesting also that monkey liver was used in, um, in horse medicine and the relationship between horses and monkeys in Japan has a long, long history. In fact, monkeys were, um, were said to be protectors of horses um, in, 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 uh, in, in Japanese stables and farms, uh, the farmers would feed monkeys and encourage them to be around the horses. The warriors would make their uh, arrow quivers from monkey hide. Uh, monkey leather was a valuable asset. Monkey uh, parts uh, were used as protectors of stables, so monkey skulls. And this, uh, this illustration is, uh, is from my own collection. This is what's known as an ama, which, well, Kauru, why don't, why don't you tell people what an ama is? Ama is a wooden tablet. Usually you see those ama in shrines when you come to Japan. And what you're going to do with emma is you write down your wishes on the on one side of the emma, and then you put or hang those emma in a certain place in the shrine to you know make your wish come true. That's what the usually emma is. So, what it's interesting to me as a, as someone who who does medicine on horses today. It, it, to wonder what we can learn from all of this. Um, there's, there's nothing in this manuscript, unless you want to start praying to the Buddhist cosmos, there's nothing in this manuscript that appears to be directly applicable to modern horse medicine today. 
So what can we learn? Well, we can learn that, you know, the Jap, we can learn about the history. So Japanese healers created their own horse medicine, which is just now coming to light. It combined Chinese medicine with Japanese theories and Buddhist mantras and plants and a whole variety of treatment approaches. It's interesting to me that I'm sure they wouldn't have written this down if they didn't feel that this medicine worked. And in some sense, I think it probably did. That is to say, many conditions of the horse get better on their own. And as a, a doctor, if you are in the position of applying something that doesn't directly harm the horse to a condition that is also getting better, the treatment can be given credit for, for the improvement, even if it doesn't deserve it. Um, so as Voltaire, the French philosopher said, nature cures, but doctors take the credit. Um, doing something for the Japanese healer provided a sense of control over unknown forces. And these lessons from Japanese horse medicine are still applicable today. Now, the um, Japan Foundation has been kind enough to allow us to put this slide up. The book is, uh, the, the translation is almost done. The book uh, is probably, the rest of the book is being, is about 50% done now. We are um, selling pre-publication copies for $62. Um, if you want to find out more information about the book or the authors, you can go to that link. Uh, if you want to consider ordering the book, and we'd be pleased to have orders, we have over 400 copies sold now around the world. Um, and when it goes into publication, the price is going to double. Please uh, take this link and fill out the Survey Monkey uh, survey, and then we'll be in touch. So, with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. And um, we'll see if I can now go to find where the comments are and see if we can get some questions answered. So let's see. Um, the first one is the first question that I see is about the stirrups on the saddle. And the question is, are the stirrups locked in place on the saddle or are they hanging down from the leathers like today? And they are hanging from the leathers. They did allow some... Uh, movement and flexibility in the feet. Um, and uh, because they were open on the side, they also um, were, the, the riders were easily able to get out of the stirrups. Um, oh, a question about what started my interest in horses in general. And um, I, without wanting to be too metaphysical about it, I was, at the time I decided to work on horses, I was uh, uh, majoring in political science. I was on a tennis scholarship and planning on going to law school and I had the opportunity to work around them and I just fell in love uh, and it, it literally changed my life and I have been uh, working about, um, uh, I've been working with them ever since. Now, Kaoru, um, have you heard the phrase doko no uma no hone? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm seeing the same question on the screen. Doko no uma no hone ka? Yeah, this is a common Japanese phrase asking you, like, where the heck are you from? You know, this is a not a good word, but, you know, basically uh, blaming you. You have no background. You have no certain or sophisticated background or nothing. Well, and I can, I can tell whoever wrote that wonderful question, we are going to include that in the book along with our other saying. So, Kaoru, Let's please make that. a note of that. Yeah. Let's do so, that. So it sounds like it bears similarities what was being done to humans, the wearing of amulets, sutras, mantra. Absolutely. Buddhist medicine did not really um, – uh, did not really um, – care about what species it was being applied to, uh, very similar to the traditions of human medicine, uh, trying to unite the sick animal with the Buddhist com cosmos. Um, the question was, did old feudal practitioners set broken horse bones? I don't, we don't have any specific information about that. My guess would be no, because even today, it's very difficult to set bones. Uh, in horses because of their size and the stress they put on their limbs. Um, 
trying trying to fix a horse's broken leg is a challenge even under the best of modern circumstances. So my guess is that for horses with broken bones, um, that was largely uh, the the end of the line. Um, Let's see, does the manuscript mention the idea that monkeys protected horses from disease? Well, the, the, it does use, as I said, it does use monkey liver as a medicine. The, um, the, the, the relationship of monkeys to Japanese uh, culture is, it way predates this manuscript. In 1989, uh, uh, Emiko Tierney wrote a book called The Monkey as Mirror, um, Symbolic Transformations in Japanese History and Ritual. And if you're interested in learning about the relationship of monkeys to Japanese society and horses is particular, um, in particular, the book is still uh, available and I just recommend it highly. It's just absolutely a, a wonderful book. Again, the author is Emiko Tierney, and the book is called The Monkey as Mirror. Let's see, what is there a history of farriers or specific care of the foot? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, we, we actually go into a good bit of detail about horse hoof care. In addition, uh, we go into some detail about the fact that horses were, um, their hooves were covered with shoes made of straw uh, even after iron horseshoes were introduced into Japan. Um, Japanese horses uh, hooves were covered with straw horseshoes for a variety of reasons and um, I say I we get into that into the book with some wonderful illustrations. We had some great help from the Japanese Farrier Association learning about the society of that. We have some specific illustrations courtesy of the Yokohama Museum of the Horse. So we get into that quite a bit in the book itself. Uh, can we talk about horses and EMA? Well, horses, I mean, as, as Kaoru said, they're used in, um, uh, they're used in temples today, but um, initially horses were sacrificed to the gods, but they were so valuable and so hard to keep, keep that it's thought that pretty soon the Japanese said, you know, rather than killing the horses, how about if we just kind of give the gods a picture of the horse? And uh, that became popular fairly early, probably 10th century, um, and is still in use today. Uh, let's see. Uh, I wonder, let's see, if the horse monkey connection is related to the journey to the West. No, not at all. This is, a, this is an old Japanese uh, thing. Um, where were the techniques that Japanese horse doctors, let's see, used? Uh, why is this jumping around? Where were they techniques used that, no, were, they're not, there don't seem to be any uh, techniques that have made it from Japan to um, moder to any of the Western cultures. Um, it's such an obscure tradition. And as I said, in the 18th century, it pretty much, they sort of gave it up. So this is definitely a historical practice and it didn't, uh, didn't, didn't, uh, uh, really spread. Um, let's see, is there any evidence of vivisection in the study of veterinary medicine in Japan? No, um, there's not. In fact, um, uh, even, even surgery on horses, like castration of horses, which is commonly done now to calm the horses down and make them more useful, was not reported until the uh, uh, 18th century in Japan. So uh, vivisection is is not part of uh, uh, what the medicine that was going on. As far as colic, uh, there's a question about would, would this help with how colic was treated? So far, it's been difficult to um, identify what conditions were being treated. Um, as as Kaoru noted with Taiba, it was a wind that entered through the nose, exited through the anus and killed the horses instantly. And I don't know of a... Uh, I, I don't know of a modern condition that would take a, a healthy horse that was moving along and kill it instantly. 
Um, so it's a little difficult, at least it is right now, to identify which conditions are being treated. Um, but uh, we're gonna, we're certainly gonna look for that. Um, did uh, did we see any influence of Western medicine? No, because Western medicine entered uh, after the uh, after this book was done. Um, were horses used as a food source? And I think um, the answer is generally no, because meat eating in Japan was prohibited for much of uh, Japanese life. They were used as food some, and there is some horse meat uh, in Japan today, but for a large period of time, uh, meat eating, and I think, isn't that right, Kaoru, isn't in Edo, Japan, uh, meat eating was prohibited? Uh, yes, yes, during Edo era and before Edo era too. Right, then the question is, do horses have instincts of medicinal plants? Um, there is some literature about some animals maybe having some instincts towards plant. Um, my experience has been that horses are as likely to eat poisonous plants as they are good ones. So I'm, I'm not really sure that there is any, um, they have any cognizance of what they're eating. Uh, will we, for, uh, the survey link again, well, let's see, I can probably do that. Let me see if I can go back a slide and that will be up while we answer questions with any luck. Um, Let's see, how about, there it is. Um, let's see, uh, there, there are the websites for people. Uh, do Japanese horses live longer? Well, no, and, you know, Japanese horses are very interesting because they're very small too. They're much more like ponies. Um, they're the native Japanese horses now of which there are a few hundred of eight different breeds are, most of them are no more than 12 hands. But, um, and that would be the Mongolian horses that the Mongol dynasty rode. They were little horses too. So um, no, there's nothing, nothing that we can really say about longevity. Uh, is there such a thing as Hayu? Um, do, you, do you know Hayu? Do you know what that is, Kaoru? Are you familiar with the term Hayu, horse oil? Oh, or bayou. bayou. Sorry, bayou. Uh, yeah, uh, I know what a bayou is. It's kind of it's still used in today's Japan as a cosmetic um, thing. I think for uh, for beautiful hair, better hair, human hair, for example. So I would I would imagine that that would it says where would you get it? Um, hoof tends to be oily, um, but I'm not exactly sure where it's from. But there you go. Uh, do I know about the history of horse racing in Japan? We touch on the history of horse racing in Japan in the book. Um, modern horse racing was introduced to Japan in the mid 19th century, but there is a tradition of uh, ritual horse ra racing at, uh, at uh, temples in uh, starting in about the 10th century. And Kaoru interviewed uh, one of the, well, who, who was it that you interviewed Kaoru? Uh, the priest? Kamiga, yes, uh, Kamigamo Jinja. Uh, we have Kamigamo Shrine in Kyoto, and one of the chief priests told us the history of their uh, horse racing. Um, there's a question as to, uh, did samurai have their own methods and uh, to heal horses? And absolutely they had their own methods, and th their methods were very much along the lines of what we describe now. They they had they had the priests, and then they developed little little sects of people and specialists at treating horses. So yes, absolutely, um, the uh, the samurai were involved in treating their own horses. A question about do we find any treatments useful now? No, although I'm kicking around the idea of making the talismans into a collection that I can sell to modern horse owners who want to throw everything possible at their horse. And some of my clients who prefer, prefer some of the more esoteric treatments, I'm sure that there might be a market for those. Um, let, we probably have time for just one or two more questions. We want to keep this to about an hour. Um, uh, let's see. Can you, there's the survey link again. Uh, can, how are the, oh, 
I want I want to take this one. Can we explain the meaning of baka? Baka <laughs> baka means in Japanese it's kind of silly and idiotic and and it's it's a very interesting word because it combines two Chinese characters, the word uh, the character for horse and the character for deer. So that's baka. And I always thought that was interesting until I was riding about six weeks ago. I was riding my horse and we were riding up on this beautiful day and there was a hill, there was a, a deer on the side of the hill and the deer saw the horse and just panicked and ran off and my horse turned around and ran the other way. And immediately both of them acted so stupid that I understood what the meaning of baka is. So it's it's from horse and deer, and it's because of their um, uh, it's because of their propensity to act a little silly. Uh, let's see. Um, the 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 it is. I, you know, as we close, I want to just repeat my thanks to my dear friend Kaoru who I roped into this project and uh, I, I'm quite sure she had no idea what she was getting into um, but um, to, to say that this this book this project could not have been done without her help is the the grossest of understatements and I, I very much appreciate uh, her help, her being here, and uh, she's also been instrumental in helping me um, get my Japanese to where I can make myself almost perfectly misunderstood all of the time. So uh, with that, I think we've probably come to uh, time on our lecture. There are some more questions. Um, please feel free, if you'd like, to, to uh, reach out uh, to me. Um, I, I can be reached at uh, uh, Ramey Equine, E Q U I N E, at gmail.com. Uh, if you do have an interest in the book, we'd, we'd love to have you. And thank you. Thank you so very much for um, listening to our talk. Uh, there's so much more information that we simply didn't have time to address. But, and the book, the book, every day I'm learning more and more, and we hope to share that with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Remy and Ms. Tomoyoshi for such an insightful talk. And thank you everyone for joining us for this event from all different time zones. Before you leave this webinar, uh, please take a moment to complete the questionnaire via the poll function. Let me pull out the now. Uh, it should be appear on the screen right now. Okay. And if you would like to comment on today's programming, you may do so through the Q&A function. Uh, we will be hosting more Japanese arts and cultural virtual events in the coming months. So please stay tuned for email announcements from us. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Please stay safe. And for those of you from the United States, happy Thanksgiving. Good night. Good night.